thank you all for taking the time to spend um, about 55 minutes here on with uh, Ben and I. Um, we uh, we're, Let's start by doing a little quick introduction. Uh, I'm Dustin Yoder, um, CEO here at Surify. Um, started about 10 years ago, and uh, we've been fixated. Um, and I, I go to sleep every night thinking about life insurance and annuity and uh, trying to figure out how to transform um, insurers. Um, so the team right now is about 310 people. Um, and uh, again, we're just strictly focused on serving uh, life and annuity uh, carriers around specifically North America these days. That's our, that's our focus and, and where we're doing business. Um, ben? Hey, everybody. Nice to meet you. Ben Brantley, Chief Technology Officer at Surefy. I joined the company a couple of years ago, um, came from a previous background of working with at a software company that built core admin systems for property casualty. So I'm a little bit of a whippersnapper when it comes to life insurance, but maybe a little less so when it comes to systems. And we're going to talk about systems today. So I'm pretty excited and I get to use my virtual whiteboard and my pencil. So um, if you can't see the board, let us know in the chat, but hopefully it's showing up. Yeah, we should be good. Yeah, Ben, ben brought, it's very rare that both on a webinar, but two, even during any discussion, um, people use uh, a white, a digital whiteboard, but we've really enjoyed it. So um, Ben, Ben is a, Ben is good with it, so do stay and uh, and and uh, enjoy. Um, let me let me kind of give the opener here. So uh, I think I mentioned that stop, don't rip and replace. Let's be honest, is a bit of a provocative statement. Um, I think it's provocative because ultimately we are under no false uh, impressions that some of your systems must be uh, replaced. Um, ultimately, there's a lot of great technology out there. Um, things are growing, new things are um, are, are opening up, and uh, and maybe in life insurance we're we're adopting some, uh, even though they're not that new. Um, but ultimately, we we do believe, just to be clear, that there's definitely reasons to do that, and we're not suggesting that uh, that you everybody has the option to not take things out. Now, saying that. Um, we we do think uh, this the title here um, is fitting for where we're at in life insurance. Um, we Ben and I have been running around uh, and our whole team, but ultimately we've been running around for um, several years. Ben came on a couple years ago um, to dive into. Uh, the industry, but also what the clients we were working with. And we were building a lot of digital experiences for those clients. Um, but after quickly Ben realized uh, the, the the legacy systems and the, the problems behind were really a, a major issue. And so today um, we want to talk about how people are addressing that, um, how they're not addressing that. And, uh, you know, the opportunities, um, to, to solve it in, in different ways than maybe people are. So that's gonna be the goal today. Um, as normal, I try to bring on smarter people than myself to these webinars. Uh, we've definitely accomplished that, bringing Ben here today. So I won't uh, suck up too much air um, like I already have. Um, so why don't, why don't we get started here? Um, ben, you know, you came over here, you started seeing, um, a problem that you understood relatively well, and you saw parallels for your last 15 years as a CTO of Guidewire. Um, but why don't you break down what you saw and, and, and I'll call it what we see every day, actually, uh, in the 200 plus uh, life and annuity carriers we go after. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'll just draw a picture of it. It's pretty simple, actually. What we see are a bunch of boxes, um, a bunch of systems and software. And so uh, for most of you guys, um, we when we talk to you or ask about the architecture and the systems you have in place today, um, we see a bunch of systems of record um, that you run your business on and have for 
decades, if not generations. Um, you know, maybe there's a policy administration system or two or three. Um, maybe you have a document store. Maybe there's a content system. Maybe there's an agent licensing and appointment, financials or commissions. Um, it doesn't even really matter. I'll just draw some boxes. But most of you have lots and lots of boxes. And you also have people that you care very much about. So over here on the left, there are folks like applicants and potential policyholders, policyholders, agents and producers, their support staff, even your home office. Um, you have people who you care about who yearn to interact with you over an electronic medium. And in order to do that, what we focused on um, and what a lot of you care a lot about is connecting those people to the information and capabilities in these systems. Um, and so to do that, maybe you build some solutions. Um, and so maybe you have uh, an agent web experience or two or three. Uh, maybe there's a policyholder portal. Maybe you have a native app. Uh, in the app store, um, or maybe you aspire to have some of those. Um, but regardless, there is a panoply of these green boxes, these experiences on the edge. And, um, and so one of the big challenges, and, and, and to be clear, at Surefy, we have for a decade been in the business of creating and helping carriers stand up these kinds of solutions. Well, the challenge is actually less about building this software and more about connecting it to this span of systems and people and process behind the scenes. Um, and that is fundamentally a systems engineering problem. And so um, the, the problem that we'll zoom in on today is kind of centered around the complexity that arises from these systems and some of the challenges they present. Um, and there are challenges unique to each individual box um, that we'll talk about a little bit here. Um, but there are also challenges in the geometric combination of having all of these needing to interact together. And between the two of those, when you pile all those together, it becomes a really tricky problem. Um, and I think more than anything else, that complexity is why I think we could, I think it's fair to say that most of us would agree that as a generally as an industry, life and annuity carriers um, are probably behind some of our peers in terms of expressing and exposing capability on the edge. And, um, and it's for good reason. Um, this is a really tough problem. So, uh, so at a high level, this is sort of the shape, you know, the, the most common shape that we run into as we talk with carriers uh, around the continent. Um, and, um, and then I think when we zoom in on one of these, we start to see that there are a lot of challenges. And I don't know if it's okay with you, Dustin, but I think we should probably talk about some of those specifically to kind of motivate the problem and then talk about the clickbait title, ripping and replacing these systems and, um, and get into more about, you know, what, what are some reasons for that? And then what, what are some things maybe that we see um, give, a, give you and us some new options that maybe we wouldn't have had two or four or eight years ago when we were looking at this problem. Yeah. And, and just to land it, we, we see this problem. Can you give like, you know, last couple of months, you know, we've been running around. Um, can you give a couple examples of like the degree of, of this problem that we're seeing? Like how many policy admins, how many portals? I mean, you, you kind of give, you're given a couple boxes. I, I think it's fascinating as we look at kind of uh, the buckets we see people in, uh, do you mind, you know, kind of sharing litter real world right now? Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about life carriers in North America is that there are two orders of magnitude, like a 100x spread in size um, from very small specialist niche carriers to the regional players to the, you know, to the even to the super nationals. Um, and so the complexity does have a span. But interestingly, from the smallest to the largest, roughly the the, com the complexity of this footprint in red stays about the same. But I think it's fair to say that, you know, the median carrier has on order three or four policy admin systems where enforced business resides. Um, and it is, it is very common to see 
a, a multiplicity of document storage systems. Um, there will be some internal and maybe a few third parties. Um, there are often one or more um, bolted on kind of agent management and agent lifecycle management facilities. Maybe those were added later. There's some, you know, there's some, there's been a lot of evolution and um, uh, innovation in that space. And so there's some new software, but in every case, the irony is that as soon as there's something new and great, it just adds another box to the picture. And from the point of view of these people over here, and maybe more saliently for our conversation today, from these systems that need to talk to these, um, as soon as that number is greater than one, um, orchestration uh, becomes a challenge. And the data necessary to drive these experiences is spread across those boxes. Um, and querying those boxes in real time to try to answer questions for these people we care about um, is just really hard. Um, and so I would zoom in and say um, some of the classic problems we see are one, that these boxes, and I'll focus on the policy systems specifically, although I'm not trying to pick on them, they're just usually the biggest, oldest, and most complicated and ornery. Um, but all these systems, in, to one degree or another, you know, first of all, they need to offer a way to get information in and out of them, probably via an API. And a lot of these systems, while they may have a few, they're pretty limited and pretty opinionated and pretty narrow. And, and some of them don't have formal APIs or don't, you know, they were engineered before that was even a consideration. Um, but getting the right ports or windows into those systems can be arduous and expensive. Um, and it can be challenging even to do it the first time. But then if you think about needing to build and, and improve and evolve these green experiences over, let's say, a five or 10 or 15 year time frame. Well, the needs of the blue people are going to shift and that's going to drive different features, which is going to drive different, put different pressures on these systems. And so it's a never ending battle, right? You're going to have to build new APIs and refine the existing ones and relitigate the protocols over time. Um, and so one of the things... Yeah, we yeah. are seeing people go at this, right? So like, mm -hmm. to your point, you're describing what we're seeing, but like, the, one of the questions I ha have, and and you know, we've been discussing, we've been we've been stating them as clients, different life insurers, both by the number and systems, but also by the bucket that they're in currently, right? So like, again, everyone, it seems as though everyone's on part of this journey. Um, can you describe just for every, you know, again, I think this problem, what's interesting about this diagram is what we've seen is we haven't seen this much change. This diagram actually just, we just add a few here and there as we learn yeah, more. Yeah. But right. the state of the clients or the state of the industry, I would say, and just for everybody, we look at the North American life insurers, about 200 to 250 real and objective North American life insurers, they're all in a, a slightly different state of, of this process. Um, yeah. Can you explain how you see it if you were to simplify it, how you mm -hmm. see the states that they're in? Well, I think um, in particular, this box, the one that says policy admin is the most vexing of all. And so um, it naturally then is the case that almost every carrier we talk to is at some point along a, a long and winding journey to translate or move off of or upgrade or migrate to a better version of this particular box. Um, and if, if I can just expound for a moment on some of the stress on this box, then we, we can talk about why, where, the, where we see people along that journey and, and the challenges that that presents. And then I think we'll, um, afterwards we can get to um, talking about, well, how can we solve for that problem? How can we, how can we mitigate that challenge? But I just want to make a, a couple more points about this box first, if that's okay, Dustin. One of them is that um, the, 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 the people over here who need things, information out of boxes like this one, place immense technical pressure on the design of the software in between. Um, and that comes in a bunch of different dimensions. One is, can do the APIs exist to get to the data in the first place? Um, another is, will this system answer my question at any time of day or night? If I want to log in, I mean, the expectation in the modern world is I can go to a retail website 
and interact with it whenever I want to in my slippers or pajamas, if that's what I want to do. Um, and I think that expectation is bleeding over into every other industry. And so one challenge with some of these is they weren't architected or engineered to be responsive 24 seven. A lot of them go into some kind of quiescent or batch mode where they do a roll up and a reconciliation and well, they should, um, that they were built to do that. Um, but then the problem of course is, uh, they're no longer responsive. And so your, your digital edge, your capabilities over here degrade or have to you have to be turned off in some cases. And that's a huge obstacle um, in kind of a legacy obstacle. Another thing that we see is even in the newer admin systems, but certainly in the old ones, the latency or the time it takes the system to answer questions on those APIs um, is higher than the sort of acceptable standard on the internet. Um, and that becomes particularly challenging when this system needs three or five or seven seconds to answer a question. And then we need to ask questions of four of these systems. And sometimes we have to do that in series. And so the query load can build in a way that makes these people at a minimum frustrated. Um, and so we see a lot of systems stood up where yes, there technically is a web experience wired to one or several of these, but it's slow. Um, and when you go to Amazon, you know, you don't expect that. And so people have been trained to expect answers instantly. And it is important to think about their time being precious, particularly for producers and those in the distribution side where they're going to do a lot of things. And so making this fast is really hard because it was engineered primarily for correctness uh, and, and speed was a secondary consideration. Um, and so we see again there that a lot of these systems uh, kind of engineered to solve a different problem. And again, that's perfectly okay. But when we think about this problem over here, um, we, we recognize that we need something else to help. So those are some of the pressures on this box. And I would just say they really add up. And I think that's one of the main reasons when we talk to carriers and they're in the midst of some kind of policy transformation. If you ask them why, I mean, there are other reasons other than just digital, but that is one of the big pressure points. And one of the motivations to move is, is to say, hey, let's, let's, let's see if we can take this out, put something in that's much better and move along a digital journey at some point. So now back to your question about where people are in that journey. The buckets, I mean, I the buckets. Yeah, the buckets of, uh, you know, if, if we were to categorize carriers we talk to um, in terms of where they are on those journeys. Well, first there's bucket zero, which is, um, we haven't, we, we, we're not doing it. Um, and I, I, I say that with a smile because I, I don't know, I, I don't know what you think, Dustin, but I, we haven't talked to many carriers who would say that they don't ever plan to do it. Um, but there are quite a few where facing down the barrel of complexity, especially if there are more than one of these, right? If there are five or seven, or we were at, we talked to a customer yesterday who had I don't know, 23 instances of a policy admin. I mean, I don't, it, it's amazing. It's almost like, it, there's almost like a sense of pride about how many you have and how much you have to deal with, but it's, it's a huge <laughs> burden. And so um, we do see carriers who haven't begun that journey um, and who are kind of face, you know, kind of, kind of uh, not excited about that opportunity either. Um, maybe looking at that with a little bit of, you know, skepticism and concern. And that's, I think that's very reasonable and well-placed because, modernizing those systems is super complicated and, 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 and is generally a long, winding, expensive road that has a lot of costs, not just in dollar terms for the carrier. So that's bucket zero. The ones zero, who are we're not doing anything, we're at status. Not, not yet doing anything, right. Um, and, and that's pretty common. I mean, that's certainly the case in, in a lot of places. Um, another thing you see is folks who've decided not to do anything for you know sort of strategic reasons like maybe one of the admin systems is old but the book that's in it is um you know is in a runoff mode it's not an active you know it's mediating products that are no longer being sold and so it's in a kind of a service closed form um and there you know it's i think it's pretty rational then to think about maybe leaving that that in place um but it's still uh, doesn't answer the question, well, what about these people over here that we care a lot about who would like to see that they actually do have a piece of business placed in that system? Um, and I think there we have, we have an answer for that. Um, but what about that's bucket, bucket two? Oh, uh, yeah. So, one, so, one. so 
Yeah, so the next bucket, I think, are people who have begun the journey or who are en route, um, who've decided, okay, we're going to build, we're going to select and install a new system. Maybe I'll just, I'm just going to, not to take away from the document system, it's really important, but I'm going to put a new, I'm going to put a theoretical new admin system here. And so maybe, the, maybe, and maybe some of you are in this bucket, you know, you're in the process of make, of moving from one to another. Um, and I think here, uh, what's interesting about this is um, it's exciting, at least at the start. Um, but one of the things we see resonate everywhere where anyone is on this journey is um, it's, it's all consuming. Um, this becomes a place where, you know, the, your, your best folks on IT and business have to focus in order to succeed at this change. And so they are pulled into this. Um, an enormous amount of resources necessarily and reasonably are focused on that, that transformation. And this thing will go on for years. So we see people in this bucket excited at the beginning, maybe a little bit shifting towards, I'm not going to say disillusioned, but kind of past the honeymoon period, sort of looking at it. And, and maybe there's, you know, maybe there's in a period of partial transition, maybe you stand up the new system and start to run some new products or new business in this system, which is great. Uh, one of the reasons you would go for that. But ironically, when seen from the vantage point of these people we care very much about and their systems, um, now this picture's just gotten more complicated <laughs> because now we have active book in the old and in the new, and we have functionality that's probably not quite the same. And certainly these APIs are different. Uh, they might even exist in the purple one and not exist in the red or be written in different languages and different paradigms. And so now, in effect, for some intermediate period of time, which I, I'm going to guess if we took a survey is somewhere between five and seven years for a full transformation at a large carrier, um, you're, in, you're in this intermediate period where actually from a technical standpoint, it's almost the worst case. Uh, you've got more moving parts, more complexity, more systems. And from the point of view of, of everything over here, it's actually more complicated. Um, and so that, that is not something that people who make policy admin systems tell you about before you start down the journey. Um, but it is something I think in retrospect, could we you, find a lot Did you do that about. to people when you were uh, selling policy admins? I'm not going to comment on my past. No. All right. Uh, but, um, but I think it is true um, as much as we'd like to imagine that the end state is, you know, is, is, is quick. Um, it's just hard and long. Um, and then at, at carriers at scale, there may be multiple of these systems in multiple states of transformation to multiple new targets. Um, and that, by the way, that goes for these other systems as well. You know, there could be an upgrade on a document system or, you know, on a financials engine or reporting tool too. Um, just admin system is where the, the, the challenge is, I think is most, um, you know, pokes is, is puts the most stress on this up, these upstream dependencies. And so we see that that's probably the middle bucket, right? The group of folks who are in transition and at one level or another. And I would say by and large, um, even with the most successful and lauded modern policy admin systems, most carriers we talk to, are in this bucket. If they've, if they've begun transformation, they started it a while ago, there was progress, and now they're sort of in this weird middle ground where some businesses now run on the new, but a lot still on the old. Um, and and it's, it's a challenging spot because the economics to migrate get harder and harder to justify, but, um, oh yeah, you called it the pit of despair. I mean, I, I don't know, but... Uh, Oh yeah, and Richard says throw a merger in the picture, right? I mean, anytime, and then any, and then of course it's natural to consolidate in this industry, just like many other sibling industries. And so, if you go and acquire another carrier, well, you've now recursively recreated the the problem on this whiteboard, but a whole another version of it. Um, I mean, it's a good point on the time scale that a real transformation happens on core policy. Let's say seven years the likelihood that nothing else changes is very low at a carrier that's dynamic and active in the marketplace. So by then there's probably some other system or some other change that's going to happen. And so it's, uh, it can, I mean, seen from one, if you haven't had your coffee yet uh, today, it can probably feel like kind of daunting and depressing to think about that. Um, but I think one of the things that we've just kind of acknowledged at Surify is 
carriers at scale are going to always be in a position of shifting in motion across these systems. It's just the nature of the beast and the and the consequences of needing to take really good care of the information and be be very careful and cautious with these with these systems of record. And the problem is that by and large, these people who I keep saying over and over that we care very much about, they don't actually care. They're not interested in the, the, the machinations behind the scenes and the challenges that these systems impose on you and us as carriers and folks trying to build on top of them. They, they just don't give a rip. They want to get online and get their business done. And so um, I, think, uh, I think this is where we at Surefy have, have a, a, a role to play. Um, and I think we need something in this big white space I intentionally left here. We need another piece of software, another system engineered to work for these people in these systems, but that understands the constant motion, churn, and complexity that is the reality for almost every life and annuity carrier today. Well, before we go on to the, you know, the, the solution, the need, I wanted to ask uh, if you're here and somewhat paying attention, uh, we got three uh, different, uh, we have questions about <laughs> if you fall in any of these buckets. And the reason is, is I'll, I'll be honest with you, and this is the, the funny part, we have yet uh, to see anybody with a uh, number three. So we really want to know if you're part of number three, uh, the completed transformation, the we're all done and we'd like to tell you about it. Um, and the reason is, is because the last seven years running around to life and annuity, what's so fascinating. Um, and I, I would say we have decent data because we're one of the few in the industry that just runs around and talks to life and annuity. It, it feels like no one's done. Um, and, and I would say, Ben, what happens? Like, let's pretend someone is done. Because we, we hypothesize, for all you on the call, we hypothesize this. Like someone gets to this perfect state of done. Right. What, what do you, do you have anything to say there? That's one question. <laughs> because is that, is that real? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of funny. I mean, so first of all, if any of you, and maybe you're going to do a vote in a minute. But I'm at, well, I'm kind of asking people to vote on the chat if they would. There, 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 there I mean, there, there have to be, we've got 250 odd carriers. There have to be a few who've successfully made a transition. And maybe we've met one or two, um, probably a smaller carrier. But, um, and if you're one of those, or you've done that in part, first of all, you're to be congratulated. And that's, and you're a rare, rare exception. Um, but I'll just point out that, Imagine that's a success. So I can erase this red one. And now we have this shiny purple one that's finished and everything's in that now. Well, what's, what's interesting about that is two things. First, the shape of this set of systems, the count and the number is still about the same. <laughs> and so the people that are on the edge still need information across a spread of systems um, and need to be able to transact and have work that lands across a set of systems. Um, and so uh, the under, you know, some of the underlying fundamental problems that we face in digitization still exist, even if we move to the, the ideal dream panacea policy system. Um, so even when we get to that, that summit, um, from the point of digitization, it's but one part of the climb and there's still, there's still more left. Um, yeah, but the other, thing, yeah, go ahead. One, one question, like, I mean, we always get this other comment to us pretty constantly too, is like, and we also have a dream. We're talking, you, you, you focused on one of the biggest chunks is policy admin. And then you get people throwing in. Then we also have a dream of the, the three, the full 360 of data or all our data in one place, or like, how does, how do our digital, endpoints or these experiences and the users access it all right. and you're not even adding those systems in here right or those 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 challenges yeah um, yeah i mean it, it it's interesting there are so many um even the best admin systems and there are some good options out there let's be fair even the best ones the engineering and work on those started 7 10 15 years ago they're new, but they're certainly not 
new in the sense that software engineers think of new. The technology is mature and stable, but not new, not cutting edge. And even the newest ones um, are engineered for data stability and integrity as their primary, primary driver. And second, to support those home office users who can interact with them directly. And only third, and frankly, as an afterthought and sometimes a bolt on, um, to support these edge experiences and these people over here. And so um, it very, it's very common for us to hear that even carriers who've deployed one of the new systems and even are very happy with it, maybe for part of their business, maybe they're in phase two, um, they would still observe that the technical performance of those systems uh, is not matched perfectly to these over here. And so we, uh, we continue to see that there is, and that just drives home that we, we really need to put something in between in order to essentially buffer the people and systems on the left away from. All right. Well, let's, let's take that turn. Um, Cause the Susan is the, we're going to say Susan speaks for the audience. So thank you, Susan. She, uh, she threw up a two on here. Um, so she is in transition and potentially in the pit of despair, our funny word. Um, but thank you. Appreciate that, Susan, for your comment. Um, you know, so if, if all else fails, we're talking to Susan here about like what what are our options? Yeah. <laughs> like, and, I, and, I, and this is a good chance to stop and just say, if you can't tell from our smiles, like we we are excited about the modernization of these systems, just like many of you are or were before you got into the pit of despair. We think it's necessary. We understand this was a clickbait title, but what we don't think is acceptable is for you to be shackled to the time and implementation dynamics of moving to a new system um, when it comes to delivering digital capability on the internet to those people that you care about. And that's what we're, that's, that's the problem we've been trying to solve. And so we have built, we've been working on building a new solution um, that we call Core Connect, but the name doesn't matter. The, the reality is it's, it's a box that sits in between and that understands this problem. And so we call it Core Connect. And without getting into a whole lot of detail on this call, um, but to entice you, it is designed to take information out of these systems in a way that does not um, impose real-time pressure on them or API pressure to have the functionality exposed in some perfect shiny way. Um, and it brings all of that information into one place in a way that is intentionally focused on serving these things over here and these people. Um, so instead of worrying about having a precise, perfect historical record of every change to the policy or contract, we care about, no, let's show people what the state of their business relationship is today. And instead of being able to allow someone to go in and manipulate an individual policy to the nth degree, we care more about, no, if you have a complex agency hierarchy uh, or agent hierarchy at a large agency, how do we make it so the person at the top of the hierarchy can see her entire downline instantly. Um, we, we, we have the luxury of saying, these systems are gonna do what they were built to do and what you've spent millions and millions of dollars and years investing in. Um, but over here, the needs are slightly different. Um, and so we can build technology specifically for that left-hand edge. Um, and so uh, what, what our solution does is, First, acknowledge the problem, and second, set about to solve it using the best new and modern tech we can. And essentially, without getting into the details, we buffer the information that's in the backing systems and kind of behave a little bit like a content delivery network. You know, Netflix doesn't serve you your videos straight off their server. They buffer them out to computers nearby your house or in your town. Um, and we do a little bit of the same thing, but for life insurance. Um, and we buffer in both directions. So we, we gather and cohere all the data out of the core systems, however many there, there are, and however ornery they may be. We bring it into one place. Uh, we assimilate it with an understanding of the agent and policyholder perspective on that information. 
and we pre-compute the answers to the questions that they ask so that when people come online, no matter what time of day or night, and no matter what these systems are doing at that moment, we can answer the vast majority of their questions in our cloud. Um, and by doing that, we let you stand up a whole panoply, a whole rich API of services on the edge, kind of independent of the state and position and transformation that might be going on behind the scenes. Um, and that's a, we think that's a pretty powerful idea. We think it's necessary. Um, again, we've been in the business of building these for years and years, um, but we have often with our customers hand in hand kind of grimaced at how hard it is to try to wire those directly to those backing systems. And so creating an intermediary that better is a better fit for the problem essentially creates a separation between the two worlds and that separation makes it healthier and, and everyone happier. And it lets- Wait, why you, Stop you for one sec. I wanna, and I wanna ask people though, as you continue on to write some of the questions, concerns, and or I'll call them problem statements um, cause I know we're getting into kind of solutioning and I also want to make sure, uh, we get some, uh, you know, I'll call it direct feedback so we can address it in real time. Um, uh, so I just want to stop you for, for a second there and make sure you're sitting there listening to Ben, like, you know, do us a favor, uh, chat in there that the problems that you see. Sorry, Ben, I had, to, I had to stop you because I, I, uh, we would like to see, you know, I'd like to throw you some curveballs here, but I, yeah. I do want to like, how do you get the data? Like, I mean, I know like the first question that we're just constantly facing is getting the data out. Right. Or. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there are two, it's a two part problem, right? One is how do we get the data out of those things and into the, into this buffer in the first place. And then the second maybe even harder and interesting problem is, okay, the data is there. Now, how do we make it so these people can actually do interesting work, given that the same problem exists in the other direction, right? In order to communicate that work down to these systems, they have the same issues with APIs, with uptime, with performance. How do we do that too? And so um, Core Connect has two architectures built expressly to solve each of those two problems in kind of their own unique way. Um, and for the data side, um, it's a little bit like uh, an analogy we were talking about the other day. It's kind of like, uh, you know, those hamburger stands where you go up to the glass. Um, yes, yeah, Susan, you're on the right track. Um, you go up to the glass and you say, okay, I want a cheeseburger. And they're like, okay, you want fries. And then you place your order and a, a minute or two later, the fast food comes out. Um, that's like the API world. Um, and what we do instead is we say, hey, how about instead of having to come up to the glass and order the meal, every time you want it. What if we just uh, built a, one of those factory, um, one of those big truck ports at the back of the restaurant and uh, in the dark of night, last night, we'll drive a, a big truck up and you just give us all the meals. Okay, the metaphor doesn't quite work because they're gonna get cold, but bear with me. You give us all the it's information. A hot, it's a hot restaurant though, they keep them hot. Maybe it's yeah. just a cold, maybe they only serve cold. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Anyway, That's like, give us all the data beforehand, right? In the dark of night. And we'll put it on our big truck and we'll bring it into our engine and we'll pre-process it. We essentially say, let's not do things in real time because these systems are not always ready or capable or comfortable doing that, at least at the level that these people need and expect the behavior to perform. Um, and so uh, it, it, we, we do use an asynchronous stream model, which comports with, a pub sub architecture to Susan's point or anything oh. that can extract and send us the data. Sometimes curveballs coming, be, curveballs coming from Kevin side. Note. Here come the curveballs. Um, but sometimes it'll be a published mechanism, but sometimes it's an extract from behind the scenes, right? So we can go to a legacy system and say, well, let's go into the database and let's capture the deltas or let's get an image and we'll compute the differences from yesterday to today. But either way we want to build kind of an industrial grade mass transport mechanism instead of onesie twosie pulling data by tediously building individual APIs. And that does impose a certain trade. It means that in here, we now need to process and understand that data, but that's a place where we feel like we're well positioned to help with that. And so what we do is we build a centralized store and it does 
have the shape that looks a little bit like a data warehouse to Kevin's question. Um, but we would not say that what we what we have in Core Connect is just or is or even aspires to be a full blown warehouse. It's more like we call actually internally we call it a data puddle. Uh, it's like a mini lake that is targeted at your domain problem and that has a bunch of opinions and a canonical representation at rest that is uh, something we can modify, expand, and improve on your behalf over time. And so, yes, there is a traditional row store database that holds structured data and that already knows how to hold various types of annuities and life policies and already has a concept of the central notion of a customer and uh, open and active cases uh, streamed in from e-applications and so forth and so on. We do have all of that. But I think as importantly, the buffering engine also buffers all the media and PDFs and documents, and files that come along for the, for the journey and that also need to be surfaced to these folks. And that historically have been very hard to do in a performant way. Um, in addition, because we have that architecture that lets you and we stream that data, um, we can enhance the computation over time. And so if we wanna add um, a full text search facility over some of those documents, um, that can be done without rebuilding the feed architecture that we deliver here. We can use the same trucks and the same back doors and the same bringing the food away in the dark of night um, but create additional processing on that to deliver new features later. And so that's a decoupling that allows us to buffer that data here and serve these people here and unload these systems. And so in a production instance of Core Connect, the users on the edge can hammer the system at any scale. We scale up or down in the cloud and your admin systems basically stay cool and, and comfortable. They don't, they don't really take much heat at all. Um, there's some more questions. Kevin has a lot of questions. Um, from the right-hand side of the problem, have you built a standard consumption model? Um, interesting. So we, we actually intentionally don't prescribe a format because we want to make it as easy as possible for you all to load the data. And so we say, yeah, we have a big truck, but it can take data in whatever shape. Just throw it all in a bin and, and stick it in our truck, and we'll, we'll open the bin and process it on our side. Or you can do that if you want to. But there's a pluggable programmable framework inside Core Connect that lets us tease the data out that's relevant and load it into those canonical storage uh, storages at rest. Um, and then the, another question is on the left-hand side, have we built a capability layer to serve the data? Absolutely. Um, so over here is a, a rich, complete, um, life and annuity specific API that um, that is our opinion of the best set of things, the best way to talk to the edge about the capabilities that that you offer. Um, and we expose and surface that API and it, it supports both the reads of all the important business data, the, the, ex, the access to all the documents and digital uh, large objects um, and the transactional support for applying a beneficiary change or making a reallocation of funds or uh, requesting, uh, sending in a notice to underwriting on an open case. Um, the API spans the entire business. And indeed, it's our dream and our hope that folks we work with will look to make the API that surfaced here be as comprehensive and complete as possible. Um, and we could probably do a whole other webinar just on what that API shape uh, can look like. But the goal is to create this, this complete, fluid, cohesive, and, and and definitive API for your business on the edge for all those outside users. And that's yeah, and one surefire mission. And one thing that I, I think, you know, we've been talking about with people is when you start talking about that, then even it opens up the door for the new opportunities for the future. Right. I mean, let's, you know, we're, we're sitting here talking about ripping and replace and kind of this legacy side transformation. But I think, uh, just as a highlight, I, I think when people realize kind of the what this unlocks, I think what's really interesting in these discussions has been, well, what is, you know, what am I distribution one? What does, you know, like they, the brain kind of goes and says, we now have this call it a middle, a middle layer to this problem. And then it opens up endless doors 
to the servicing. I mean, do you have anything to highlight there? Like what this, you know, call it what you've even seen in um, the client's desires to do here, Ben? Yeah. I mean, I think most of the future desire goes beyond kind of the, just the data coherence part and moves to the, how do I let people actually do business? How can they transact electronically over an API? And there in Core Connect, that's the other half of the architecture, we, we have an engine that lets us describe or lets you describe your insurance processes in one standard computational frame. And by describing those individual transactions in our engine here, um, we're able to run and support the interaction with those transactions also independently of these systems as much as possible. And then only when necessary or desired do we out of band commit the transactions or the requests to the backing systems. Um, and Can you that, give some examples? Mm -hmm, yeah. Give some so, examples of those states or something? Right. So, for example, if someone embarks on a beneficiary change request over here and wants to do it across you know, a, an assortment of policies and annuities in parallel, let's say, that's something that we can support fun, you know, f f as a first class transaction in Core Connect, um, even if behind the scenes, that's going to trigger a cascading sequence of commits to a variety of different systems, because maybe the annuities are over in one policy system and, you know, that and then some of the, the signed signature documents, if required, need to land in a document store and something else needs to go to, into a queue for an approval uh, from compliance if the if the policy is of a certain size. Um, the system can orchestrate over that the people and the systems behind the scenes um, and you know, lots of people have tried to build things like to do that over many decades. Um, but we're in a unique position today that the technology has gotten much better in the last few years to support this. And because we're tackling both the read and the right side in this sort of dual mode, those two um, architectures can leverage each other. And in the end, we think that's what you need to close over the problem. If you want to create an amazing API and therefore great experiences and therefore make these people super happy, then you need a complete set of information about the state of the business, plus the ability to transact over that business. And ideally, we want to do that without creating a lot of real-time blocking dependencies on these backing systems. Angela threw in a, a nice comment here as well about ownership, platform, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so good question, Angela. So we deliver this solution in the middle in our as a cloud SaaS software as a service, but with our with each customer we work with, they own their instance of that solution, and so the data that flows is theirs; it's not ours. Um, the processes that you encode can be your own proprietary flows, or you can use our starting points, which we think are pretty good. But you know, you're going to have some things that are special for, that you guys will want to do. Um, but it is a it is a cloud model, and like most other computation that's done at scale now, we need the benefits of the elasticity in the cloud in order to do enormous amounts of computation when those trucks arrive every night, uh, but then be ready to scale dynamically as demand flows in on the internet, you know, all day, all. all yeah, and we've been and Angela, we've been dealing with like going back to the beginning when we were ingesting we. we Early on, we were building engagement applications, sucking in all the different information about policyholders. And there was always this question of ownership, um, cloud, et cetera. And we know like we're, we're the SaaS provider, but ultimately this data is your data. It's your customer's data. Um, and so we we think we've figured out um, and it seems pretty, pretty standard, actually, uh, in that, you know, you own the data. It's all design, you know, designated environment for you, et cetera. Um, but again, the world of AWS and cloud, et cetera, is, it, it feels, it feels like we're there. I, I say we're not, um, oh, sorry, life and annuity has moved to a place of, of being relatively comfortable there. Um, that's what I found. Um, Kevin mm -hmm. has a comment. Kevin's got, you guys have a lot of good questions, actually. Um, how, how configurable and flexible is the engine? Um, so. In addition to knowing and understanding and having empathy with the mess of transformation happening on those backing systems, um, it's also not our first rodeo working with you guys uh, on your insurance problems. And we know that you're just going to have your own uniqueness. And so engineered into Core Connect 
is the ability for you to extend, override, and even completely replace where needed different aspects of the system. And so you can take our base entity model and extend it. You can have your own transformation logic or we can d develop it or your SI partner can do that work. Um, you have the ability to extend or enhance the APIs on the edge. Um, and of course you can deploy your own transaction microservices in our flow engine. Um, all of those things are designed from the beginning to be uh, to be managed within our platform in a way that lets you extend them and us upgrade the capabilities of the underlying platform over time. And that's a good segue to talk to just noting that this is a big piece of software to engineer, but we think it's not only necessary, but it's important that we build it in a way that you and we can upgrade it over time because four or five or seven or 14 years from now, we're still going to need something with approximately this shape, except the demands are going to be different. And so we need to be able to improve. And, and it can't be something where we hit a target, declare victory, have a cake, and then a year later, it's spoiled and already out of date. And we know that happens out on the edge with those UIs. The UIs and the frameworks, I mean, they're like strawberries. They're delicious. And then they get old. And you got to go back to the store and buy another one next year. And it's kind of, it's almost laughable how often we have to replace those edge those very edge technologies. But this middle piece is designed to, you know, to, to stand the test of time and I think is analogous to a core system in terms of its durability and its design intent. Um, but uh, I, don't know how much those, I don't know how much those are updating themselves these days, but that's a different story. Sure. Um, I know we're at, we're, we're running against the wall. I'd love to hear, uh, let's see, there's any more Angela, thank you. Kevin, thank you. Susan, any any other questions? We got a couple minutes left. I always leave a, you know, get you out of here in a, a couple minutes early, unless someone can throw us a couple more curveball. Oh, here we go. Uh, Kevin threw one. We're on the same wavelength. I must have answered his question while he was typing it. Um, you know, the other thing to be careful about here is I, I'm just drawing a picture on a whiteboard, and it's like, well, okay, they say that, but who knows. Um, if you're, if you're interested in this at all, um, I would encourage you to reach out to us and let us go to the next level because it's not only really interesting and I think is a, is a useful thing to think about, even if you're thinking of trying to do something like this yourselves. Um, but we'd both love your feedback and also we love this, you know, your stress testing our design. Um, and, uh, and yeah, um, Real-time data is powerful, effective, improved customer service. Yep, agreed. Core Connect is shifting this to buffer. Yeah, so Core Connect is like a near real-time buffer for the data. It's like a replica that's designed to be sort of domain specific, but it's never the system of truth. It's always a replica, a cohered replica of the state in the backing systems. And to that end, it'll always have you know, some latency and some inaccuracy, usually in the time domain, not in the correctness one. Um, but we think that's necessary. And we also, when we observe how other enterprises build 24 seven retail grade systems, that's how they do it. When I look up an item in Amazon, it's not hitting SAP to see the state of their supply chain back end to, to tell me whether I can buy this thing today. They have that thing buffered um, and synthesized into something on the edge so they can answer questions quickly. And that means, you know, one time in a million, it's a little bit out of sync and it turns out that item's not actually there. But 99.9% .9 of the time, it's more than good enough and the trade's worth it. And so there's a similar architectural trade here uh, that we think makes sense. Ultimately, though, simply having one place where everything can come together is pretty valuable in and of itself. And most carriers we talk to, even though all of them are on some kind of journey to unify data in some way or form. Um, it, it's another another journey that's been hard to reach. And so maybe we need a webinar on that too. But I, I'm with you, Sunitha. Um, Janet asked, how long does it take? Um, a, a while. <laughs> it's not easy, right? We're, we're basically saying this has to be a core part of the infrastructure of, a, of the future life and annuity carrier. You need something with this shape, even if it doesn't come from Surefy or it's gonna be really hard to deliver these comprehensive APIs and the real experiences that we all know people want. Um, for us, we look at it as, you know, let's do the, let's, let's build some of those big uh, container uh, trucks in the first phase and get a working system. And then let's roll on transactions and more services over time. Generally, you're looking at somewhere between 
eight and 16 months for that first phase. Um, that's been our experience so far. Um, there, there's some variables that could shift that one way or the other, depending on your priority, but it's something in that range. Um, and it, there's a close to the, to the size and lift of a, of a course, you know, policy transformation. If you're already on that journey, this is going to feel a lot lighter weight. There's a couple more there, uh, Gunnar and uh, Sunit, they came back with a question, um, but. Yeah, so we have some experience with DI on the, in some of our other um, product lines. Um, so we're familiar with the sort of shape of those policies. Um, Core Connect is new. We just announced it last year. Um, we don't have a disability policy in production on Core Connect yet, but we're pretty confident that we can flex to handle a lot of those other types of policy shapes. Um, but we haven't done it yet. Good question. Oh, uh, write, writing data to legacy. Yeah, so that's on the on the other end of the architecture, right? We let people interact and do business. Now, how do we commit that data back to those systems? And really, that's one of the most interesting things because we can commit it later or we can commit it never and simply send it to some human who does it today. Um, and that sounds weird. It's like, why would Ben be saying that we would do that when we're talking about digitization? Well, that's because these people over here they don't actually care how the data is committed to your legacy systems. So if you've got a transaction you want to express on this API, but maybe you don't want to actually go pay the cost to build APIs and all these backing systems for that transaction yet, well, we can surface that transaction in full fidelity over here and queue it for manual processing behind the scenes if you need to. And that acts as a bridge that's very practical, right? It lets you create a digital experience that everyone loves and independently decide if you want to upgrade the backing systems to do a real time write or or just keep it the way it is. And we think most carriers are going to find a, a spread of need where some transactions need to be fast and they're so high volume that it's worth building the full electronic path. But for other exotic transactions, maybe not. Maybe you keep it manual for now and see how it goes. And if if you want to upgrade it later, you can. Yeah, and so, I know Ben mentioned it is, you know, we have uh, some really fun demos, um, like literally of the live of our live system, but showing you kind of how, because at the end of the day, right, it's almost easy to show, like using one of our DXPs on the on the, you know, the edge here, like, oh, a beneficiary change, right? And then like, and then you show it and they update their information. And that's one thing. And what's, what's fun about I guess the complexities that this deals with is the fact that that's not usually the case. Like the amount we're doing beneficiary servicing systems for many carriers right now, but that simple like click and update is not actually what we see happening or their reality on the back. And so to be able to show the different, we actually, the demo is more about the complex things than it is about the, you know, update now, put in a new name, et cetera. Um, because that's the holy grail across our, our, our carriers, the amount of different nuance, you know, writing back in or offloading and dump that night to this person or whatever, maybe into the system and some go to their person. That's really where the rubber meets the road. Um, and that's what's really cool about the system is it was built with that in mind, not the happy path, I call it, which is when you're like me, you start with happy path and that's what InsureTech did. Uh, they just showed happy path and assumed that that would get all the buying. Well, that's not true, right? It's all about showing you guys, you all here are managing 10 systems and they all have a different non-happy path. Um, and so, I don't know, that that's where it gets really fun because we actually have built it for those as well. Um, I know we're at, we're at the end here. Thank you all for coming, as we said, um, email us. Uh, we'd love to uh, show you more, show you how we're doing it, show you a live demo, et cetera. Um, so really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Ben. It's always nice when someone talks more than me because um, then I don't feel bad. Um, so thanks for, for that. And uh, we look forward to hearing from those of you that want to talk more. So thanks again. Have a good one. Thank you, Ben. Thanks all. Bye.